uh, for the lab, you are going to be going out to football field, intramural field. Uh, that's where you can easily find the yard markage. And what you're going to do is you're going to have someone, or you can take the video yourself, of you doing a 300 yard show, which is you're going to go out to the 25 yard line, just touch it with your foot, don't worry about touching with your hand, run all the way back to the baseline or the end zone line, and then back again to the 25 and back. You're going to be doing six of those total trips. So that's going to total 300 yards. And you are going to do that as fast as you can. Warm up first, take some time uh, to get ready for it. Once you finish, try to stay moving, meaning kind of walking, getting your breath back. Try not to stay still. Then you're going to have some issues with uh, the wonders of accumulation of lactate, which is super uncomfortable, and I would highly advise against it. And, but you guys can go ahead and do that uh, if you want to. depends on how you guys want to kind of ride on the pain train there. And then you are going to go ahead and write up about effectively what you saw. Um, and we're going to have a conversation about the split. So you're going to watch the video of yourself performing that 300 yard shuttle. And you're going to figure out how many seconds did the first 50 yards take? How many seconds did the second 50 yards take? The third, the fourth, the fifth, and all the way up until the sixth. So we're going to be able to see that relationship and that fatigue as you happen to go through it. Um, yeah, that's fine, Catherine. You can go ahead and do laps on your phone. You don't have to actually do videos of it. That's more than fine. And does that kind of clarify what we're looking for for the lab this week, guys? Awesome. So let's go ahead, guys. And we left off talking a little bit about growth hormone. Now, uh, growth hormone is super useful for helping our tissues recover. And remember, it's going to effectively, positively uh, cause improvements in every single tissue, except for really synthesis or anabolism. And it's only gonna have catabolism in fat. So that's the only type of tissue in the body that actually decreases in size and doesn't have improvements thanks to growth hormone. And growth hormone is gonna be released in relationship to your exercise intensity. So if you're training really intensely, meaning doing some really high intensity sprinting, uh, shorter recoveries and otherwise, that is where you're going to see a much greater amount of growth hormone release. Now we then have our thyroid gland. This is where we're gonna be producing our triiodothyronine and our thyroxine. Um, obviously the precursor amino acid there is thyronine and we are adding three iodines to it in order to make it. Now. T3 is the bioactive, and it also has a situation where there's free and total. The free is what's actually having the physiological effect on your body. The total is just kind of how much you have. And then the T4 is the precursor hormone, which is not uh, going to give you the same metabolic effects. Now, these are going to cause an increase in metabolic rates. So individuals with hyperthyroidism, meaning they're producing too much of these hormones, they are going to have a really fast resting metabolism. They're often going to have a really high resting heart rate. Uh, they can have issues with heart palpations and otherwise. It's not a great time. Now, on the other side, individuals that are hypothyroidism, low metabolism, low resting heart rate, they're going to feel really tired, lethargic, and they're going to have a heck of a time trying to lose weight. And so exercise itself is going to have a little bit of a positive effect, but if you do like a really large amount of aerobic style training, it is completely normal to have a suppression of your thyroid hormone production, specifically when we're talking about going into the marathon, ultra marathon, crazy long distances in that hormone production. And so this is one that's really important because it's related to your overall energy, you know, how you're feeling throughout the day, which is also going to be tied to uh, hypothyroidism, uh, things like brain fog and uh, also uh, depression uh, or just, you know, a lack of enjoyment and energy because you don't have the hormonal support of it. Hence my previous recommendation for every single one of you guys in the class to get a complete and total blood panel done now because you're probably never going to get any better hormonally speaking than you're going to be when you're 18 to 22 years old. And that's a good thing because then you can go ahead and do that comparative data with your body as it changes over time and see effectively kind of what's going on. Now, we are going to signal for the release of thyroid hormone by the anterior pituitary. And this releases thyroid, thyroid stimulating hormone, TSH. 
They really broke the mold there. So when we're talking about exercise, we are going to go ahead and get that short little boost. But when we talk about doing prolonged, really large amounts, that's where we're going to have that lower T3. Now, we then have our adrenal medulla. The adrenal glands, the medulla, and the cortex, it's just two different portions of it. The medulla is where we are going to be producing our wonderful sympathetic nervous system hormones of epinephrine and norepinephrine. Now, this is really useful because the higher the intensity of the exercise, the more we're going to go ahead and dump that sympathetic, uh, that we're going to have a bigger sympathetic nervous system response, which in turn is going to give us a much bigger epinephrine response. And so this is going to help increase heart rate, increase contractile force of our muscles. It's going to increase our blood pressure to a certain extent. It's going to help our body break down more carbs for fuel and fat for fuel, along with increasing blood flow to our skeletal muscle. Now, the key is your overarching effect of epinephrine is it causes global vasoconstriction, but the local mediators of vasodilation are going to override it. So what that means is you have less blood flow to everywhere in your body where you don't need it and more to where you do. So a really good example of seeing like the effects of hardcore sympathetic nervous system, have you guys ever seen or maybe yourself, you turn white, like you just got really pale because of being really scared, afraid, you know, had something really traumatic occur. That's a great example of a real hard epinephrine response. So, only one of you guys. Well, I'm glad whoever that is, A, is okay, because you can talk about it, and B, it's okay, folks, it's okay. So, you know, for example, myself, uh, like I told you guys on Monday, I was gonna go do the heavy squatting, and I went and did that uh, in the lab, and, you know, it's, you gotta get your mind right, and it, it went really well, actually. I mean, the numbers, I, I, I hit the, my 425 for a set of five, uh, no belt felt, felt strong, felt good, you know, probably need to do more leg drive. But the thing is, is I finished the set and felt really good about it. And then I try to write in my training log how I did. And like, I did not have that fine motor control because of the extra effects of epinephrine and the sympathetic nervous system responding equal. My body was not able to, I wasn't able to do very low force applications. So pros and cons to catecholamine use, but they are incredibly important for performance. Now, the other part of the adrenals, the cortex, this is where we're going to release our glucocorticoids, mineral corticoids, and gonadocorticoids. Now, what does that mean? Well, glucocorticoids, that's cortisol. This is the major stress hormone that's going to help you make more glucose through your liver and other systems. It's going to help us free up fat to use for energy. It's also going to increase our protein breakdown. So it's good in that a certain amount of cortisol helps with decreasing inflammation, but it also decreases our immune response. This is why if you train really, really, really hard, it's actually easier to get sick than if you just train with a moderate intensity. And then sedentary people get sick more than everybody else. So just don't be sedentary and don't overdo it. Now, this is, once again, a very useful hormone for when you're exercising to help your body essentially prepare and overcome the stressors of that training. However, this is a hormone that if you happen to have it high all the time because you just need a very stressful lifestyle, specifically, it's not so much the stress that you're under, it's all about how you perceive it and how it affects you. So... If you are a psychopath in the true sense of the term, where you don't really have feelings or concern, or more sociopath uh, concerns for other people, you can put a lot of, know that you're putting, not, you don't emotionally feel that you're putting a lot of people through psychological stress and damage, but you can effectively have that type of situation in your life where that individual, because they don't see it as stressful, it's like, yeah, so what if I, cheat on my taxes, I'm breaking the law, I'm doing all these things all the time. It's not stressful to me because I literally have no capacity to care about it. Whereas a normal person would be freaking out if they were doing a bunch of illegal activities and trying to live effectively a life of crime because it's going to be, you no. Know, once again, it's what you perceive as stressful. So I'm sure a number of you guys uh, have, you know, moderate or to a certain degree, you know, you just get some test anxiety. And so, you know, some of you guys have probably had a test that you studied, you understood material, but 
your essentially your stress response got the better of you and your performance went down on the exam because you weren't able to focus. Now that's also looking at kind of epinephrine response, not just cortisol. So it's the cortisol over the long term that's going to give us some potential health issues. And that's where you're talking about effectively chronic diseases that occur just due to lifestyle stress. Does that make sense to you guys? All right. Now, our pancreas inside of our GI is going to be where we're producing insulin from the beta cells, and this is what's going to lower our blood sugar. The only two tissues that are sensitive to insulin is your fat cells and your muscles, and that's where it's going to go. On the other side, we're going to have glucagon, and this is what's going to be released when our blood sugar is too low to help raise it back up, because it turns out our nervous system really likes using carbohydrates as fuel. So we're going to use these two hormones to keep our blood sugar within relatively eh, somewhat tight blood parameters in a normal healthy person. Now, when it comes to type 1 diabetes, okay, is type 1 diabetes a issue with a lack of receptors for insulin? Yes or no? Is type 1 diabetes a issue of a lack of receptors? for insulin. All right, folks. So type 1 diabetes is a lack of production of insulin from your beta cells. It's usually an autoimmune disorder where your body literally kills the cells that naturally produce the insulin. It's not a lack of receptors. Type 2 diabetes is typically more of an issue with the lack of receptors, and then hence a lack of sensitivity to insulin. Now, we want to make sure that we have glucose available to all of our tissues. Like I said, the brain really likes using it as a fuel. So we're going to break down that glycogen from the liver, put it in the blood, and be able to ship it to the muscles or any other tissue that it needs it to help regulate that blood sugar. Now, once we go too far, that's when we're gonna undergo a process known as gluconeogenesis, literally meaning making new glucose through using glycerol from free fatty acids, breaking down protein, specifically alanine, and then also using lactate to once again, get us back into glucose. Now, we are going to use not just glucagon, epinephrine is gonna help increase glucose by breaking down that glycogen and will, so will norepinephrine. The issue with it is it also increases the use of carbohydrate inside of our muscle cells. And then cortisol itself is also not just going to help increase glucose, but it's also going to cause a increase in that breakdown of fatty acids and breaking down of protein. So now Growth hormone itself, it actually works against cellular glucose uptake. It works more with, uh, with the freeing up of fatty acids for energy, and individuals that are abusing growth hormone are literally going to start to have potential issues with, effectively, insulin resistance. And that's why, on occasion, you hear about pro bodybuilders that are not just using testosterone, using growth hormone, and they're using insulin. And that is terrifying to me. But I live my life on my own morality, which is different than your own. And it's obviously different than other people's and the decisions that they're willing to make in search of the solitude. Now, our T3, T4 is also going to help with glucose catabolism and fat metabolism, just really helping us turn over calories in general. And the higher our exercise intensity, the greater amount of glucose that we're going to be freeing up from the liver so that we're going to have it available as a fuel. Now. If you understand this figure, you've got a pretty good working understanding of how our hormones and blood sugar are going to be affected by exercise. So as we increase our intensity, we've got more epinephrine, epinephrine and norepinephrine. We're going to be breaking down more glycogen from the liver and the muscles, and we will effectively burn through our muscle glycogen before we burn through all of our liver glycogen. Now, as we increase in duration, so how long we're training for, 
We're going to be using more of that liver glycogen until eventually we completely deplete it. We are going to be trying to take up more glucose over time, and that's thanks to that liver release of glucose. And as we are going to start driving down our glycogen levels, we're going to keep increasing our hormonal production of glucagon to try to overcome that and keep our blood sugar relatively normalized. So if we look at that graph, you guys see how we have that when we first start exercising. Now this is up to 180 minutes, so we're talking three hours of cortisol is going to peak at about the half hour point and then come back down. Our glucose level is gonna be relatively maintained if you talk about percentage wise from baseline, but notice how your glucagon is gonna go up and then hold and our epinephrine and norepinephrine is gonna consistently increase over the entire duration of that training. Now, mobilizing glucose is only part of it. The other side is going to be our insulin response which is now whenever we are going to take in some form of carbohydrate, we are going to release insulin to drive that glucose into our muscle cells and then also to our fat cells to a lesser extent. Now, our insulin concentration during exercise is actually gonna go down because it turns out we're not trying to utilize this and our cellular insulin sensitivity is gonna go up and this is thanks to upregulation of what's known as GLUT4, glucose transporter four receptors on that will go and translocate to the membrane, the sarcolemma of our muscle cells, specifically the muscles we're using. Hence why exercise is one of the major factors to help control type two diabetes because you can naturally improve their insulin sensitivity and AKA their glucose sensitivity literally just by getting them exercise. Now, if they're already exercising and they've got issues with type two diabetes, that's, oh, they're in their own little trouble. But I can talk a little bit about insulin glucose in this at the very end. Um, and kind of, it's, it's fascinating when you see those relationships. Okay, so we are going to mobilize and free up fatty acids so that we're going to be able to utilize them for energy specifically within or with aerobic long distance exercise especially when you're getting to things like marathons, your average person, um, and mind you, this is based on like 154 pound European male, has about enough carbohydrates stored in them, like in a perfect world, or not, with a, a normal diet, so to speak, about enough carbohydrates to last for about two to three hours of pretty consistently hard exercise. Now, once you go beyond that, you're going to have to utilize free fatty acids. And like we talked about in energy production, beta oxidation is only going to get you the energy production at about two thirds of the rate that you're getting from carbohydrate metabolism. So we're going to start to break down more fats as a fuel the longer that we go. And we're going to be doing this by breaking down fat in our stored fat cells. And then we're going to be transporting those free fatty acids through the bloodstream into the muscle. And from there, now we're going to go ahead and break them down for energy through beta oxidation inside of the mitochondria. So it's a lot of traveling you got to do, hence why it's not a great way to maintain resistance training performance acutely. That's that ATP PCR system and anaerobic uh, glycolysis, depending on how many sets and reps you're doing. Now, we are going to limit our lipolysis through insulin. Insulin actually is going to work against fat loss, and that's why there's some arguments for things like the ketogenic or just low-carb diets to help people lose weight, uh, you're kind of focusing on individual trees in the forest if you're gonna go that direction. It is true, however, if you happen to do better on a high carbohydrate diet and lower fat diet, and that happens to be the method that works for you to help lose weight, then by all means, go ahead and do that. Epinephrine and norepinephrine are going to effectively turn on hormone-sensitive lipase inside of your fat cells, as will cortisol and growth hormone. So these are going to go ahead and allow us to take those individual or those triglycerides, so that means three fatty acids bounded to one glycerol, and then break them down into glycerol and three individual fatty acids so they can go into the bloodstream and do what they need to do. Now, when we start exercising, another big component is dealing with our fluid and electrolyte levels, which is as we're sweating out, our, we're losing a significant amount of plasma blood volume. As that goes down, hydrostatic pressure and osmotic pressure is going up, meaning we've got more electrolytes on one side than the other. This causes 
us to now, because of having a lower blood volume, make the heart work harder. So we're gonna to have to pump more frequently. And that's what's referred to as cardiac drift. We're gonna get into that more as we go on. And it can also have negative effects on blood pressure. Now, we're going to use hormones from our posterior pituitary gland, our adrenal cortex, and our kidneys that are all going to help overcome this. Specifically, we're gonna be releasing what's known as antidiuretic hormone and oxytocin from the posterior pituitary. Now, this is gonna be released thanks to the use of neurological signals. And antidiuretic hormone is gonna be the one that's being released specifically from, for exercise, and it tells our kidney to pull, pull more water back in. Do not let go of water. So you're not going to obviously have to use the bathroom as much, and because of this, we're going to have a better ability to hold on to water. Now, this is all thanks to the effects of hemoconcentration. So hemoreceptors in your body, if you look at the figure on the right here, are going to recognize that we are having to increase our osmolality, which in turn tells our hypothalamus to then neurologically instruct the posterior pituitary to release our antidiuretic hormone, which then goes to your kidney. Once it gets to your kidney, your kidneys now are going to actively hold on to sodium more and hold on to water, which in turn is going to help us minimize our water loss and hopefully avoid dehydration. Now, this hormonal response is something that you're going to develop with time, thanks literally to, you know, our body does adapt in certain ways to or yeah, acclimatization and acclimation to warmer temperatures. But it is something that requires time for the body in order to make these types of changes. This is more of the acute hormonal response. Now the adrenal cortex, the mineral corticoids, specifically aldosterone, is going to uh, help the body essentially hold on to greater amounts of sodium. So now we're making sure that we're not losing our effective uh, electrolyte, specifically the one that happens to be typically the most important if you don't have to uh, live with a Western diet, simply because sodium in nature is a much harder mineral to come across than potassium. Um, it's just the way that we salt the heck out of all our foods that it kind of becomes flipped on its head. Now, this once again is going to help us hold on to sodium, which is going to pull water with it, and it is going to increase our release of potassium. So this is a good effect to avoid acute dehydration, but one thing that is very fascinating about the way the body is set up hormonally, which is we don't have a good way to get rid of excess sodium. We only have a good way to get rid of potentially excess potassium, and then we'll just pee out extra water if we have it. So what this then makes the major repercussion of it, which is the easiest way for you to lose excess sodium is through sweating. So if you're not sweating, and you happen to have high blood pressure, this is why they put people on a low sodium diet because it becomes a way that you can effectively start to have them hold on to less fluid, which in turn is going to decrease their blood pressure because their blood volume is not going to be as big, pushing as hard inside of their wonderful vasculature. Now, aldosterone is going to be signaled by low sodium levels, low blood volume and blood pressure, and high amounts of potassium. Now, when it comes to the blood volume and blood pressure in the kidneys, the kidneys are very sensitive organs and they don't want to be essentially under too much pressure. And that's the, when they talk about the silent killer effect of high blood pressure, it's because literally they're very fragile uh, filtration systems. And if you have a high pressure going through them all the time, that's equivalent of having super high pressure on the pipes in your house. And if you cause those pipes to burst, you got a lot of water damage, only in this case, you're gonna have damage to the cells and you're not going to filter the blood as well anymore because all of your tissues have limited abilities of recovery uh, from damage. And if you overcome your ability to recover from things, then congratulations, you typically only live as long as your first organ failure. Um, unless it's the kidneys, then you can go on dialysis, which looks really, really horrible. And you know you can have a couple other organs kind of fail and you can do hormone replacement therapy to kind of help you go a little bit further. But the longer you can keep everything stock option on the human body, the better things tend to be for you in the long haul. So 
Now, the kidneys themselves is where antidiuretic hormone and aldosterone are going to actually bind. Now, they are going to secrete what's known as erythropoietin. EPO is released in response to low levels of oxygen going through the kidney, which is going to naturally happen during exercise. HGC one alpha is the actual gene that gets activated that causes that. And EPO, in turn, is going to signal for your bone marrow to produce more red blood cells. Now, this is a good thing because it's going to allow us to increase our hematocrit. When we happen to be doing something like aerobic style training, it's going to make us better at it. Or when we happen to be at altitude, it's going to give us a greater oxygen carrying capacity of our blood, which once again is going to make us a better athlete, keep us safer, and allow us to move a little bit further. Now, renin is going to be an important hormone when it comes to effectively our ability to now activate angiotensin in or angiotensin gen, which is the precursor into angiotensin and then angiotensin two, which is going to cause vasoconstriction, which is going to help us regulate our blood pressure when we happen to be doing stressful style training. So, yay. So, renin itself is going to activate angiotensinogen into angiotensin 1. That literally is going to essentially cleave out genoni. Then your ACE enzyme is going to convert angiotensin 1 into 2, which in turn is going to cause aldosterone to be released. Most every single hormone in your body, guys, works through effectively a flow chart. A affects B, affects C, affects D, and then gives you the final effect. So, and we obviously have a lot of different hormones that are really important for athletic performance, for recovery and health in general. Now, osmolality is effectively how much electrolytes, you know, this is going to be protein, ions, everything else that has a charge is going to be inside of our fluid, intracellular fluid, extracellular fluid. When we happen to have a higher amount of osmolality in one area than another, it's going to pull water into it. And then if it has lower than the area next to it, the water's going to leave. It. And this is what's going to cause hydrational shifts. Now, aldosterone itself, thanks to sodium retention, is going to increase osmolality. That increased osmolality is going to help us retain that water and not allow it to go out into your nephrons, your ureters, and then eventually out into your bladder and then into the world. So aldosterone itself is going to work for a pretty decent amount of time when, like after exercise. Uh, depending on how hard you were training, how much work you were doing, you're going to see your ability to hold on to this water can happen to last for a decent amount of time. You're also going to have some water um, modification, not modification, but holding on to a little bit extra depending on what's going on with you hormonally, specifically if you're female. Uh, depending on your cycle, you can have some modifications of aldosterone, which causes uh, fluid shifts. And that's why uh, those of you guys that have never you know, ever had a candid conversation with a woman about their uh, monthly cycle and or are a woman, obviously, you know, there's ladies that can easily be up more than five pounds, depending on, you know, kind of in that premenstrual phase, thanks to literally hormonal effects on these values. So one of the last things that I want to touch on before we're going to go ahead and do a little bit of individual work, so to speak, today, which is the difference between total amounts of hormone, free amount of hormone, and then in turn, the thing that we can't really get at for a lot of hormones, which is the sensitivity. So what we have here, guys, is specifically the levels of testosterone and what's to be expected for different age ranges. So notice there's the total with a standard deviation around it. Then there happens to be the free testosterone also with a standard deviation around it. Then what's known as sex hormone binding globulin, which is going to be binding up obviously your uh, testosterone in this example, and then the standard deviation around it. Now notice as a gentleman gets older, so from age uh, 45, on, we're effectively expecting your testosterone to decline a little bit every decade of life. And that makes sense. You know, as we get older, you're just not able to do what you once were able to. Now, for most guys, they're going to really hit their peak in testosterone levels, typically in their 20s and or early 20s and or late teens. And then those numbers are going to go down. The free testosterone levels, which is the amount that's actually biologically active, is going to change with time. And then in turn, 
we are going to be affecting your uh, hormone, uh, your sex hormone binding globulin, which can go up as you get older, thanks to stress and otherwise, which is also limiting your effectiveness of those hormones. So when it comes to testosterone, estrogen, or estradiol is what we're talking about there, uh, progesterone, and then other things like, um, I mean, you don't really look at growth hormone levels too much, but definitely T3, T4, it's going to be really important to understand that it's not just how much hormone you have, it's how much hormone is actually free, so it can be biologically active, and are we really looking at the metrics that are going to be useful? So thanks to things like literally your CAG repeats on your uh, X and Y chromosome gives you your sensitivity to androgens. So, you know, some folks literally need a lot more testosterone in order to have the same type of effect on their overall health and wellness. So, um, does anyone have any questions there on kind of what we're talking about, the difference between free, total, and then kind of the total number of receptors and sensitivity when it comes to testosterone? <laughs> or any hormone in general? Because I'm about to tell two different stories and I'm going to quit recording because I'm not gonna put those up on the internet. Okay, well, since we don't have any questions, 